Good afternoon. My name is Mia Phoebus. I'm holding up a book that I'm very proud of, Reminders of an Eye Not Left Behind. There are two subjects that poets have always been intrigued with since Sappho in the 8th century BC in Greece. Nature, seasons, and eternity. So I thought today I would like to read a poem about spring, summer, autumn, winter, the effects of winter, and one other subject that has fascinated us all, philosophers, artists, painters, and poets from time immemorial, and that is the quality of eternity. But first is a poem about spring, and here goes my glasses and my first poem. A tablecloth of green spread before me, thick layers applied with a sharp palette knife. Fields of common variety daisies greet me impudently democratic, scores of lupine in mad purple gowns. A chorus of thrushes and cricket sounds haunt the tall grasses, splashed with mustard yellow and layered of apple orchard green to ravish sense, sight and sound. A weariness of mind and soul is laid out to pasture, and temporarily things suspended, put on hold. I am reborn again in an eternal spring, wearing a laurel crown of green tumultuous green, beyond decay and scuttled grain and houses, tossed by an indifferent world. It's really extraordinary that with Petrarch of the 12th century, Shakespeare of the 16th century, Francois uh, of, oh, I have his name, Francois Villon of the 17th century, Wordsworth of the 19th century, and Robert Frost of the 20th century have always been involved in seasons. In a sense, why? Because the seasons reflect the variated moods of human beings and particularly poets who are always ravished by the sound of nature, by birds and leaves and the changing seasons themselves. The next is, of course, summer. And I call this poem Summer's End. In a curious way, it reminds me of the last few days I had with Tennessee Williams because it really was the end of summer, but it was end also of summers throughout the world because of the coming war. I call this poem Summer's End. Cram words of summer's halcyon days in your mouth like ripe cherries. Break the skin showing cherry red and taste them in a frenzy of delight. Resist hackneyed phrases of bureaucratic stone-faced speech like trapped birds without wings, silencing melodies yet to be sung. The poet waits on words, hatched to maturity, but if he falters and lapses into talk, just talk, parts of speech ripped apart, he stands naked like the town idiot at a fountain square. Join master singers who cross hands at every road with a lyre and a poem to cling to every bough, on every tree, and heard throughout the universe. There is something about autumn that has always haunted me, fascinated me. It's the end of a season with colors that are violent, burnished, and yet a coming of something which we least expect. I probably must share my love that autumn might be my favorite season. So please let me read you the poem simply called Autumn. A slash of crisp blue fell across my face and I knew that autumn log chafing in the wings of a cruel hot summer had finally arrived. 
the exhilaration of a clean swept sky after months of mottled clouds and summer's humidity that swells the brain was almost more than I could bear. The smell of soft rotting apples on soaked grounds, rows and rows of pumpkins in their bright orange gowns sent my senses reeling from Venetian colours and bronze to gold and russet reds. Autumn is a time when the blood races, a season to halt summer's madness of dust and enervating heat. Autumn, my beloved season, dispelled thoughts of temporal death and frail mortality. But where would we be without the oncoming winter that does strange things to all of us? And yet it has a beauty all of its own, the whiteness, the purity, that, that color white is like the mystical color, that you can imagine all the other kind of rainbow colors inside the white itself. Poets have always known that. Nothing is really completely white, but I call this poem Snowflakes. Snowflakes spread on a field like yards of white silk. No footprint to disturb stretches of infinity without a human sound. The snow exudes an icy purity the ground beneath sheltering remembered shoots of green. Icicles, vine-clustered crystals, hang from evergreens so fiercely beautiful it takes God's breath away. I stand in a snowbound world, in violet, robbing nature of speech as time steals man's posture of immortality. And then, there is a time when all seasons passed and we stand in the midst of idealities and dreams that are part of every seasonal change. How does one reckon with winter that cuts off the arteries of joy, severing the rivers of life? The air shivers with the cold, time holds its breath, and all of nature hibernates. Spring hides like a thief, but when the rivers open up to the sea, the snows begin to melt, and life takes on an hysterical note, clapping hands with all living things. With the arrival of autumn, the world is transformed into forests of maple green, of maple trees that shed crimson red and liquid gold, and a chemist's delight when men's hearts are turned inside out and the wings of birds tremble less nervously. And I can't leave the seasons without reflecting on eternity. The one thing that all has thought about for thousands of years no one quite understands, but we use the word. Tell me, mother mine, how long does forever last? She looked at him, then gazed upward towards a seamless, immaculate sky. She answered him ever so quietly, a day plus eternity. Thank you.